what skills will be needed in this increasingly complicated world and who defines these skills? How do we have to learn to be successful in the future labor market? Who's going to teach and how? What are the best approaches? This is what our next panel will be about. But before we start, we will watch a brief film. Together, we redefine learning. The challenges and chances of today's world of digital education are very diverse. What we need now are innovative ideas and projects that point the way to our future of education. EdTales are an interactive storytelling format created by the Federal Ministry of Education and Research. It illustrates the variety of digital means and tools for actors in higher education. EdTales presents four very different characters and adventures that aim to inspire you to think digital education even further. Let's meet Niels, who has been a teacher at a daycare center for a couple of years now. He loves his job, but would like to take on more responsibility and advance in his career. However, he lacks certain formal qualifications. In between his daily work and family life, he sets out to reach his goals. Niels checks the possibilities available in the education sector for part-time training. He has found several courses which fit thematically to his training goals. Niels would love to take over the position of head of the daycare center one day, but he would need at least a bachelor's degree to do so. He finds a part-time master's program where his professional training and his six years of work experience combined are meeting the entry requirements. But later on in his third semester, Niels is visibly exhausted from trying to balance work, studying and his family. Lifelong learning is a continuous development and improvement of the knowledge and skills needed for employment and personal fulfillment through formal and informal learning opportunities. It is focused on the motivation to learn and draws attention to self-paced and self-directed learning. Stimulation, acceptance and participation are the main challenges in this context. For Niels, all the hard work has paid off. He is now the temporary head of the daycare center and still has one or two years left to finish his studies. What are your ideas for encouraging and innovating lifelong learning? Yeah, that was our virtual character Niels and now we will go on with our panel discussion. I am pleased to present Rona van der Zander who will set the scene. She is a successful young woman who founded startups and is not only an entrepreneur but also a moderator, a teacher and TED speaker as well. Her, speciali uh, her specialty, just uh, guess what? <laughs> It's a future of work and education and here she is, here is Rona van der Zander. Let's go on a journey into the future. Imagine it's the year 2035. Our world is even more globalized than today, and all global powers have committed to tackle climate change. The days of the ego state are over. Our world is highly connected and highly digitized. This is Farida. She's a software developer from Togo. Farida never had the chance to proper formal education, what we used to call it back in 2020, but Farida had access to online e-courses, to digital communities, and she learned about new technologies, about coding, and she eventually founded a very successful startup that grew, became a global player, and Farida is now handled as the new Steve Jobs. Everyone in Farida's company has a growth mindset, is innovative, and learning is not only part of their job, it's also their passion. Let's get back to 2020. Where are we today? We already live in the so-called VUCA world. It's volatile, it's full of uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. So everything around us is constantly and rapidly changing. Our future is remote first. Digital will be the norm. 
physical exchange will only happen when it's really necessary. And we already experienced this here today in this global hackathon with people joining from all over the world. In our reality, the innovation spans are getting shorter and shorter. New technologies are implemented sooner and sooner. Just think of the clumsy phones we had 10 years ago and the incredible devices that we have today. Also, new technologies like AI will have a fundamental impact on basically every life and every job. With all of this, the innovation spans and the half time of knowledge are getting shorter and shorter. So whatever skill you possess today, it is being made obsolete faster and faster. If you start a bachelor's degree today, by the time you graduate, half of what you learned at the beginning is sort of already outdated. So with all this, with this crazy VUCA world we are in, learn to work is over. It doesn't exist anymore. Our future is learn, work, learn, work, learn, learn, work. Lifelong learning is not a buzzword anymore. It's already here. It's our reality. And it's certainly our future. Because in a future where everyone has to change jobs and professions several times in their lifetime, the self-motivation to be a lifelong learner is paramount. So this is our reality. This is where we're already in. Where are we with our education systems? We are still stuck in a frontal teaching setting, delivering knowledge exam pressure, killing the motivation to become a lifelong learner and keep the curiosity to discover new things. I guess this picture is familiar to many of you, and it's not old. This is what most universities and schools looked like before the COVID crisis. In the last few months, we have taken this setting online, and then it looked like this. But not much has changed here. It's still the old way of thinking and teaching, delivering knowledge. In German, this is called Vorlesung, lecture. It literally means to read something out to someone. And it stems from a time when reading was a privilege. I brought you another nice German word. Abschluss. Abschluss is graduation, and it means end. Finally, an end to all this learning. So many of my students, they're so happy when they finally get their Abschluss, when they're finally done with all this. But there is no more Schluss, there is no more end to learning in a lifelong learning setting. So what do we need? What skills, what settings to be successful in this crazy VUCA world? We know that in the future, soft skills will be the new hard skills. While we still need some hard skills, some knowledge, of course, of some things, some technical knowledge, soft skills are becoming more and more important. And I would really like to call these soft skills differently. I would like to call them Khufu skills. Ku, because they're already current and super important today, and fu, because they're certainly important for the future. Because in a future that's full of constant and radical reskilling, we need self motivation, curiosity, communication skills, flexibility, the openness to constantly adapt and learn. Now, we know this, but in our current education system, we are not only not training these skills, we're even actively detraining them. We know that we need this in the future, but we're still trying to squeeze competencies in limited curriculas. And that's pretty absurd. I told you about the black tiles earlier, that I think they were really the horror for many of us this year. But despite the black tiles, this spring, I was also very hopeful. In March, when the corona crisis hit here in Germany and we went into the first lockdown, corona also pushed us all of a sudden into the digital era. And in March, my phone was ringing non-stop. I 
I had so many universities calling me and saying, Rona, you're so digital, can you help us to move into the digital space? And all of a sudden, everything was possible. We developed new ideas, new content, new modules, and everything was so solution-oriented. But just a few months later, not so much of that was left. I don't know how many times I heard this summer, we plan in presence this winter. Only one goal, back to the old world, back to the old setting. In April 2020, Peter André Alt, who's the president of the German Rectors Conference, called for the summer to semester to be postponed. In June 2020, we had more than 2,000 lecturers signing a letter warning against the forced digitalization of universities, and they called for the defense of face-to-face -face teaching. You can still read their letter online. It now has more than 6,000 signatories. When it comes to digital education, especially here in Germany, but also in other European countries, we see that we are still lacking a lot. Infrastructure, equipment, skills, knowledge, content, but also the mindset. I had a conversation the other day with a professor, and she said to me, Rona, I've been here since 15 years, and nothing has changed. Talk to me again in 15 years and I'm sure nothing has changed still. And I see this a lot, that this whole digital stuff is only an exception. As soon as corona is over, we want to go back to where we were before. I told you about Farida in the beginning, and that she didn't have access to former elder education, but that she had the right Khufu skills to be successful. If we don't finally manage to transform higher education and our education system as a whole into the places where people are prepared for the digital world and the complexity of constant and radical transformation, 2035 is looking pretty grim for us. Now, I think that if we know that the future is full of radical reskilling, we really need to rethink our higher education systems for them to still be relevant in 15 years from now. I think college is basically for fun and to prove that you can do your chores, but it's not for learning. Do you guys out there agree with the statement? Well, I guess we always learn something, so we also learn something at university. But if in the future you can learn anywhere, at any place, and certificates don't matter anymore to employers, what should universities be? What should they offer? What should they stand for? Should they prepare for the working world? Should they offer research? And what's the significance of one and the other? How do teaching and researching impact on each other? I believe we have to ask ourselves these questions urgently, but no matter what exactly our answer is to these questions, we need a radical mindset shift and we need an infrastructure push. And we need it now. Because I imagine universities and higher education as the future engines of our societies, not as the places lagging behind, as critical places of our societies setting the tone. Let's fast forward again to 2035. No one needs to go to a place anymore to learn, research, teach or study. Learners organize themselves in digital networks and communities. And if we're honest, to a large extent, that is already happening today. I learned and worked a lot from my vegetable pitch and from under the hazelnut tree this summer. And we experience this, we're experiencing exactly this also here today in this global hackathon with ambitious people joining from all over the world, finding innovative solutions. And in the future, we will see even more flexibility here. 
year-long degrees don't exist anymore. There will be short courses, nano degrees, micro degrees, and all that transdisciplinary and intergenerational. Universities, they might still exist, but only if they offer prime digital infrastructure for people of different generations and different backgrounds to meet, reflect, research, and think critically about important topics. And not only technology plays a role there, but also things like history, ethics, humanities, and the arts. And all that cross-cultural, cross-country, and cross-disciplinary. Now, campuses, they might also still exist, but only if they are showcasing our societal transformation. They aren't concrete jungles anymore, but they're characterized by biodiversity, renewable energy, vertical gardening, and again, prime digital infrastructure. Companies, they might offer projects for the learners, but more importantly, their employees keep a lifelong relationship with the campus. They are passionate about learning. They love to return, to exchange, and to act as mentors and to our mentees. Because our view of the teacher-learner relationship will have also entirely changed in a few years. And it's marked by collaboration. And I know that so many of us are living this, exactly this already today. And if you look at these images, you see that the future to such a large extent is already here. There are so many great people, projects, ideas, and you guys out there working exactly on this. And that gives me hope. And speaking of hope, let's look at Farida. What is she doing in 2035? How is she using the university system? In 2035, Farida regularly exchanges on projects and topics with students via the virtual campus. She gives input for research and she updates her own skills. The university is an analog and a digital place that fosters future mindsets. We can't foresee the future, but we have to shape it. And to a large extent, we realize that the future is already here. So let's push these topics, let's push these ideas, and let's work to get them on together. Because we have to disrupt ourselves or we will be disrupted. And that's why I'm so excited that we are here in this forum and that we will now discuss the next steps together, also in this panel, to see how we can st take steps forward to redefine learning for the future. Yeah, thank you very much, Rona van der Sonne. Have a seat, please. Thank you very thank much. You. That was quite inspiring. And uh, yeah, a little bit radical as well. <laughs> <laughs> but um, now we go on with our panel discussion and I may introduce the other participants as they were. We say hi to David Middlebeck. Ah. And David is uh, the co-founder and chairman of the global nonprofit Tech Labs, which helps more than 1,000 students every year learn coding skills for free. Uh, Antoinette Angelova Krasteva is with us. Is it, is it? Yeah, there, there they are. Okay, An Antoinette Angelova Krasteva is with us. Antoinette is General Director for Innovation at the European Commission and responsible for developing and monitoring the, the implementation of the EU Digital Education Action Plan. We also uh, have uh, Professor Petri Suomala. Petri is the Vice President of Aalto University in uh, Finland. Uh, or we mentioned yesterday they are organizing DG EduHack. Petri is a remarkable expert for nearly everything has to do with computer communication and information. Our panel is completed by Sasha Besuhanova. Sasha is the founder of MoveBG, a nonpartisan platform for collaboration in finding sustainable solutions for the state. And Sasha is also a steering group member of DG EduHack. To all of you, uh, have a, a nice day and maybe you can raise your hand. Can can you hear me all? Yes, yes. And uh, 
If you have any comments in our panel discussion and you want to go in, just raise your hand so it's better for us uh, and I can see it. I watch, uh, I watch it here at the, at the screen. And we start with Sasha. Sasha, um, talking about so-called future skills, uh, which ones will be needed for uh, the education and labor sector of tomorrow? Uh, well, uh, Rona put it in a very nice way. Uh, it is clear we are living in time of transformation and disruption, and it is manifested in every single aspect of our life, in the business, in the social and political const constructs, uh, in art on individual level also. And um, obviously, COVID crisis is catalyzing this process of transformation. Uh, hopefully, um, we will not return back and we cannot return back uh, to uh, where we've been uh, pre-crisis. Uh, but um, we need to train today the people uh, that will be able to address the challenges of the tomorrow world. And uh, if we look at it uh, from that perspective, uh, obviously uh, there will be more and more artificial intelligence uh, around uh, us. So we need to strengthen the human intelligence uh, to be able to create, manage, and uh, use with wisdom the artificial intelligence. Uh, climate ch challenge, climate crisis uh, uh, is very, very critical. I personally believe that uh, this is potentially bigger crisis than the COVID one that mobilized the world and hopefully will stay with this experience and mobilization in accordance to uh, address the uh, climate challenges. But uh, what skills would be needed and culture would be needed uh, is obviously uh, people to follow, to follow green culture of living as also to be creators of eco-friendly economy today and tomorrow. Uh, we have more challenges uh, that are on the agenda already, but uh, obviously will be more and more um, the uh, focus of the activities of the tomorrow's generation that we train today. And uh, this is growing and aging population in the world. So obviously we need to secure productive and sustainable food economy to be able to feed the uh, more people that will be living on the planet, but also uh, to uh, really uh, secure uh, the wellness uh, habits uh, for late age uh, personal productivity because uh, those will be people that will uh, learn life uh, long but also they will be active in the economy also for longer. Migration is another challenge so we need to uh, be able to create tools for effective cross-cultural communication and integration, but more importantly, uh, to grow people with the culture of tolerance, uh, which is very much needed at the moment. Uh, so for to be able to navigate and be creator of the world of tomorrow, the people that we educate today uh, need to be equipped with uh, digital skills, the obvious one, uh, the basic, uh, but also the advanced, uh, so that they can uh, participate actively in the shared economy, in the on-demand economy, uh, to be able to integrate IOTs, Internet of Things, as part of the uh, production and delivery change, uh, chains of the enterprises where they work. Art and creativity, and um, seconding uh, also what uh, Rona said, uh, the soft skills, um, uh, but also the ability to think creative, to take decisions in the fast-changing environment becomes very, very critical, not only for survival, but uh, for being active participants and maker of the tomorrow's world. Uh, green culture uh, is very critical to uh, be incorporated uh, from very early stage in the educational system vertically to uh, all programs, university, formal, informal, and uh, cross-disciplinary thinking, problem-solving agenda, like the hackathon uh, uh, today, uh, which is uh, just one of the examples. Thanks God there are many yeah. uh, like this. 
So uh, to conclude uh, on this topic, uh, uh, when we uh, look into the educational system of the future, uh, we should create a common agenda for formal and informal educations and uh, to be open for the new pockets of innovation that are in co-working spaces, in the elective classes, in the peer-to-peer -peer learning. And this to be one integrated process that also people accept as uh, more than uh, just following the uh, traditional uh, university got programs. And the world is going in that direction. Thank got, you. Got it. It's, uh, Sasha, uh, thank you very much. Uh, now you have opened up many, many fields. Uh, and if we want to conclude it, my answer was uh, name a few future skills. So what are future skills? Just name three to me, and then I can go on with my panel. Well, uh, I've mentioned creativity is very, very critical. And uh, uh, second thing is uh, uh, to be able to, um, uh, to connect the information and to transform it into problem-solving yeah. uh, uh, agenda and uh, also collaboration. It is very, very critical yeah. to build this collaborative uh, um, spirit uh, within the, among the people because the world goes to co-creation, uh, sharing collaborative agenda. And this is the, those are the axiomas of uh, the world of tomorrow. Yes, thank you. And maybe one magical word is also flexibility, which uh, Rona uh, showed us in, uh, in her first input. And that uh, takes me to Petri. Petri, what are your experiences? Are educational institutions prepared to integrate them, these future skills in their curricula? Thanks, uh, and, and thanks for the possibility to, to join this very interesting panel. Uh, and thank you, Rona, also for an inspiring, inspiri inspiring uh, opening of, of the panel. Um, I think in, in higher education, uh, currently, uh, we are not doing as well as we should in, in really developing generic and, and transferable skills, uh, uh, sort of a critical future skills in, in our curricula. Uh, the reason is mainly due to the uh, teaching methods, as, as Rona already hinted towards, but also quite strong uh, disciplinary domains that, that sort of prevail. And I, I fully agree that we need to not only use corona uh, as a, as a, as a as a possibility for, for kind of a rebuilding higher education, but really reshaping or, or shaping it in, in, a, in a new way. And, and the mechanisms that we need uh, is, is very, they're very much connected to, to, to interaction between disciplines and, and rethinking the methods that we use in, in teaching. I think future skills they need to be present in all the courses that we taught, not really uh, seen as an isolation, uh, as a kind of a non-disciplinary afterthoughts after, after disciplinary courses. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Petri. And uh, I must say, without technique, there would be no future education uh, we are talking about. And that leads me to David from the technical perspective. So how should it be then, David? Uh, please tell us about uh, the most promising uh, approaches and how do they affect long life learning? Yeah, thanks a lot also from my side for the invitation, first of all. Um, and I think to answer your question, actually, it's uh, important to consider what uh, Rona and also the short video before uh, have mentioned, uh, which is the fact that lifelong learning for future skills needs to be really self-directed on the one hand and self-paced on the other hand. And especially with increasing you know, experience and also age, uh, it's, it's basically almost impossible to find two similar individuals that have exactly the same pace and uh, the same learning direction. Um, unfortunately, also, uh, like, like Rona just uh, said, most of our current um, education opportunities, I wouldn't say they are very self-paced or self-directed, right? Um, they're more like one-size-fits-all approaches. Um, and I don't necessarily just talk about traditional lectures, um, but also about most online courses, actually, uh, which are designed for thousands of different people. 
uh, who again probably have very very uh, different needs um, so long story short i think we need to innovate the teaching methods um, to be really self-paced and also self-directed um, but still giving a lot of guidance uh, for the learners. So I don't think that learners just organize themselves, as Rona has just su suggested. Um, but yeah, otherwise we can just say, well, here's the internet, deal with it. So we need still guidance. And I think the most successful approaches, um, maybe to just mention two or three dimensions here, um, are those that really integrate learning technologies deeply into the process, because technology is, is here to help, I guess. Um, so the first one is blended learning, and I define that a little bit more broader, I would say, than just merging online and offline experiences, but actually combining lots of different resources and content. So in the future, every education institution, I guess, uh, needs to collaborate much more in terms of content, creating uh, videos, but also sourcing videos from other institutions, blog posts, podcasts, also looking to the wide range of the content that's out there, the great content on the internet. Of course, there's a lot of crap as well, but <laughs> there is very good content that can be integrated. So we will see much more collaboration and the most successful approaches will uh, actually leverage that intelligently. Um, and I think it's quite naive to think that as an educational institution, even as a great one, you are um, the best one of, for teaching in a, like an entire subject. Um, the second dimension, maybe to mention another one, is personalization. Um, like everything around us is personalized uh, in terms of technology. Everybody knows Spotify and Amazon and Netflix, but uh, we are kind of 10 to 20 years behind in education, I guess. And there are uh, technological like approaches that can actually leverage uh, this to analyze skills of learners to then intelligently combine different sources and we've actually run a few experiments at our nonprofit um, a few years ago and found out that it increases the time to or like increases the learning effectiveness by 20 to 30 percent just by personalizing these courses, which is, I think, a huge potential going forward. And maybe to mention one final dimension that uh, I see for these very successful teaching approaches in terms of um, future skills. It's not all individualized. It also needs to be based on communities. So community building is still a really crucial part. And that's probably where universities come into play to allow for interdisciplinary approach. Of course, facilitated by maybe digital matching uh, platforms, right? But as Petri has just uh, said, interdisciplinary exchange and uh, making innovation happen is still a really crucial part. So it's not all sitting in front of your PC in, an, uh, in the home office. Uh, it's also based on offline interaction and community building in the future. So that's uh, basically my uh, maybe a bit optimistic picture, but I think technology is here to help and can, can help us across these three dimensions a lot in, in the next years. Yeah, this is uh, quite interesting. Uh, also, like uh, if uh, you say, yeah, we need more individualization and more freedom, um, what does it mean for the Abschluss, uh, as Rona said? But we can uh, point it out maybe later and uh, ask now um, Antoinetta, high expectations of uh, politics. Can you tell us about the EU, EU's initiative uh, to support skills development? <coughs> Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I would like first to start by saying that I'm really delighted to participate in this uh, fascinating event and uh, in today's panel. I'd like to also thank uh, Rona for the very uh, passionate and inspiring uh, presentation. It was also very interesting to listen to the other uh, panelists in all these uh, um, interventions. Uh, very important issues uh, were raised and of course they've been high on our radar for already a long time it is clear that the skills are at the heart of the eu policy agenda and we recognize that the investment in people and their skills will be vital for the europe's recovery from the current crisis uh, it was already mentioned that uh, businesses need workers with uh, the skills that are required to master uh, the green and uh, digital transitions, which will be at the heart of uh, our recovery from uh, the crisis and our future growth strategy. 
people also need to actually to um, get access and be able to benefit from uh, the right uh, education and training from inclusive and quality education in order to thrive in life and actually to have fulfilling uh, jobs. Uh, we uh, believe that a lot has been done over the past years uh, at uh, various levels, uh, regional, national, European, but uh, as it was also shown, uh, uh, shown in the other interventions, there is still a long way uh, to go. It is clear that uh, the um, COVID crisis has been a turning point in terms of uh, digital uh, education, in terms of the use of digital technologies, and we feel it in uh, all parts of uh, our uh, lives, of our economy and society. So for the EU, uh, there has been a, a very direct response to this crisis, but also to the already ongoing digital transformation uh, in particular, I'd like to refer to the recent adoption of a number of important policy initiatives, a number of uh, communications. Uh, the first one, the communication on the European education area, uh, which uh, uh, needs to uh, become a reality by 2025, the new digital education action plan, the new uh, skills uh, agenda. Uh, it is also important to underline that uh, um, alongside the policy initiatives, the billions of EU funding that will be put forward in the EU recovery plan, as well as uh, the future long-term EU budget, will provide a unique opportunity to address existing challenges and deliver on our policy ambitions with regard to uh, education and training and uh, um, skills development. When we talk about supporting skills development, we need to look uh, from three different dimensions. The first one is uh, the emerging skills uh, needs. The second one will be the quality education that is needed for the skills development. And the third one, the validation and recognition of uh, skills. Uh, as I already said, uh, actions are being undertaken uh, already and have been implemented at various levels. But let me very briefly give you a few uh, example, examples, uh, starting with the emerging skills needs and recovery. Uh, on the side of the European Commission, we have been already uh, conducting research before, but also during the crisis, in order to better understand what the emerging skills needs are and how best to support the member states in their recovery, but also with regard to the uh, digital and green uh, transition. Uh, in the last uh, few years, uh, as you probably know, we've been already implementing a digital education action plan from 2018, and uh, we have uh, carried out different pilots exactly to see how to use artificial uh, intelligence and learning analytics to predict the skill uh, shortages. And uh, in uh, the time in the years to come, uh, these pilots uh, will uh, become uh, possible to be used as online services which will allow, for example, higher education institutions to uh, improve their educational programs with the view to uh, better address labor market needs. Another action that is also very concrete and I would like to uh, mention uh, is the European Graduate Tracking Initiative. This is our link to the labor market. Uh, it is indeed very important to get feedback from the graduates after they finish their education. Uh, in order to make sure that the knowledge, skills, but also the competencies that uh, they have uh, acquired uh, are of the necessary quality and that they are relevant uh, to the world of uh, work. And we are looking forward to the rollout of this initiative by uh, 2025. Looking at the quality uh, education in order to uh, have uh, skills development, uh, let me very briefly go through the new uh, digital education action plan, which has two key uh, policy areas, namely the creation of a high performing digital education system and the development of digital skills and uh, competencies. It is important to underline that the new action plan is wider in scope. It puts uh, particular emphasis on uh, lifelong learning. Um, it will be uh, also with a longer duration for seven years in order to align with the uh, programming uh, period. Uh, and it will address uh, challenges that are related to the COVID crisis, but also that have been already known and related to the ongoing digital uh, transformation. 
many of the challenges were already mentioned out simply like to underline that uh, there will be in the focus of the actions to be implemented under the plan and they refer to the infrastructure to the digital content to the uh, need to um, ensure quality skills and competencies which will be actually at the core of uh, the challenges uh, in response to the crisis uh, what will be really important to make sure is to um, avoid uh, and not to allow the digital divide to deepen further. And we've seen certain challenges during the crisis. Therefore, we are very much committed to continue working on actions uh, that will address uh, the infrastructure uh, issues or new actions such as uh, the Connectivity for Schools uh, initiative with a special focus on the rural uh, areas. Uh, I would like also to note that uh, through the uh, new action plan, we would like to continue implementation of successful initiatives. Such uh, an initiative is uh, the European Code Week or uh, to uh, upscale initiatives like the uh, Selfie, which is uh, a self-assessment tool for the digital uh, readiness of uh, uh, schools. Uh, we would like also to uh, look at uh, high quality uh, digital education content and how to build it on the European cultural and creative diversity. And for this, we will uh, continue working with various uh, stakeholders. It will be uh, also important to cooperate with uh, the stakeholders in order to identify the needs of the different levels of education and that's how best to uh, address uh, the challenges. We are looking forward to, to uh, uh, launching a feasibility study on the creation of a European exchange uh, platform. Uh, it will be very important to make sure that uh, Europe is able to catch up uh, and create its uh, own common space uh, with the view to uh, share certified online resources and the link existing education platforms. Uh, it was already mentioned that advanced digital skills are uh, extremely important for the economic recovery and development, and we would like to continue uh, and upscale uh, successful uh, schemes like Digital Opportunity Scheme, which has already provided traineeship of more than 15,000 students and recent graduates uh, with uh, acquiring who have been able to acquire basic and uh, advanced digital skills through cross-border uh, traineeships. Uh, inclusion was a point which was uh, mentioned in, uh, previous, in the previous interventions, but also during the uh, panels of, uh, of uh, yesterday. Yeah. And this is indeed a very important uh, issue for us as well, which we would like to address in a horizontal uh, manner. Uh, act there will be actions which will contribute to the overall level of digital skills and competencies with a view to boost the digital literacy and basic uh, digital skills through um, education and uh, training. Uh, it will be important to promote also computing education across the curricula and also to ensure that um, uh, young people will have the necessary competencies, uh, for example, students at the age of 13 and 14. Uh, we would like to make sure that, uh, uh, that they perform uh, well, and uh, this issue is uh, uh, addressed by 2030 by decreasing the level of underperformance, um, making it lower than 15%. Uh, a very last point on the assessment and recognition and validation of skills is this is extremely important when we are talking about uh, lifelong learning. Um, higher education institutions and private sector are certainly very much in favor of measures uh, which aim to support the recognition of alternative uh, learning pathways in order to stimulate the upskilling and uh, reskilling and the lifelong learning perspective. And uh, through the new uh, action plan, we would like to update the digital uh, competence framework in order to foster common understanding and common language on uh, digital uh, competencies. We are also planning to develop a common European digital skills certificate that will allow Europeans uh, to have their digital competencies assessed, but also recognized uh, across Europe and that they can valorize these uh, competencies. Last point to mention here, 
are, as the list is indeed very long, and yeah, it's very uh, our plan is very ambitious, <laughs> is uh, the approach that uh, we would like to apply with regard to micro uh, credentials. I will stop here just uh, uh, to conclude that uh, from our perspective, what is really very important is uh, uh, to is that the skills and uh, education will be at the center uh, of uh, the recovery from the current crisis. And we need joint efforts at all levels in order to properly address the existing uh, skills uh, uh, gaps. And of course, the Commission uh, on its side is uh, ready to fully play uh, its uh, role. Yeah, uh, Antoinette, thank you very much. Different positions, different actors, of course. Um, and uh, I want to bring it back here um, uh, to our physically present guest, uh, Rona. Rona, uh, it is very interesting because uh, on one hand, I've just heard now from the different views, uh, there should be more freedom. Mm -hmm. There should be more individualization so, uh, and uh, self-determination. Uh, and on the other hand, there is maybe... Um, the, the, the policy makers, they want to set the frame for the society and they, the member states, for especially Europe, they should be all on one level. So isn't that a hurdle? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, I, I don't have final answers either, right? And I think the future will also show some of these things. But I, I thought it was very interesting what David said. We can just p give the people the internet and leave them. Yes, we can do that because everything is there. You can learn everything online. You can do everything online technically. So what about guidance then? So some people need guidance, some not. I, yeah, and I wonder a bit if that's also our view because we are brought up in the setting always that there's someone in front that tells us what we have to learn yeah, and yeah. what we have to know we are brought up like this all our lives yeah. and I think just imagining now it's like a bit mind-blowing but just imagine that actually everyone knows what they need right everyone knows what they need to learn in a way it's a very different human image if you want to and if but if we enable that and I think we definitely need to enable that but you have so much knowledge in the internet like David also said it's overwhelming in a way and how do we help people support people to actually find their way in this overflow of knowledge because you can learn everything online you can do everything online there's so many resources so many opportunities and communities like you mentioned as well we can go in calls we can exchange we can learn together so i think it's a different image in the future of the learner itself and of course also the enablement we need for this i still personally would love like i said also in my talk universities and educational places to be there also to be independent of companies right now we're seeing that companies are setting up their own universities universities and their own campuses because they say, oh, they don't get the skills anyways, our employees need lifelong learning, so we just do it ourselves. And in my view, um, it's not only SAP and Lidl in the future that have their own universities, but also independent campuses where also other things play a role like humanities and the arts. And so I would welcome that if there is some sort of support from the countries, from the European Union. And I think you can combine the two if we shift our view on how things should work there. I think this is really very difficult because uh, uh, if you are really self-organized, if you are a strong learner, this is all not a problem, of course. But there are a lot of people in the society who needs guidance, maybe, or who want to uh, learn like uh, in an old-fashioned way. I, I, I call it, you, you know what I mean? Old yeah, I know what you mean, but I think that's also what we said before about the home office, right? We said we can't leave people at home because we have to control them. If they don't have pressure, they won't work, you know? I, I'm the boss, I need to see my, my employees employees in the office nine to five to know that they work. And now all of a sudden, everyone is at home and the world is still running. Companies are still running. On the contrary, we even see that they're running better than they did before. And I d of course, people have different needs. People need different support. Again, that's also an amazing opportunity in technology because that's what David also said. We have this frontal setting and everyone has to learn at the sa same pace. With technology, it's possible to support people more <laughs> on one and one and more in different pace as well. Um, but yeah, I think we need, a, we need a shift, as you see there, on many ways, and maybe also in our own minds, you know, what we believe, what people need, yeah. um, and what they may not need. And I think the home office there is also a very good example because we see it's working, and people are even happier than before. And uh, we see that, you know, there were also a lot of positives in there. Again, we're in a pandemic now, it's all like, 
like a bit of crazy setting, but um, I think we really have to take a new view there at some yeah. things. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. Homework, uh, uh, home, uh, and <laughs> homework online conference. Is not yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it was working, but maybe not in all cases. Yeah, uh, but that has uh, something to do with technical issues. But yeah. uh, and, but and it, new it finding new ways yeah. there as well, for sure. In my job, I see overwhelming people all over because of this information uh, a flood in the internet for and sure. disinformation stuff like this. So um, I want to address uh, this um, uh, problem or this question to all other participants. Just uh, raise your hand if you want to add something. Sasha, please. Yeah, um, I understand uh, Rona's enthusiasm and uh, she's uh, professional into digital knowledge, digital education. But I think that nothing can replace the human interaction. So different type of knowledge is the so-called tacit knowledge. And the mm -hmm. tacit knowledge is what you generate while interacting with the other people uh, in a collaborative way. And I think that the ideas for tomorrow yeah. for many of the innovative businesses uh, or causes that uh, are to save the world are born exactly in this uh, physical interaction. So we should find a balance so that uh, this creativity also is stimulated and uh, goes because uh, uh, the digital world uh, sometimes is a little bit sad. Uh, this yeah. is very good, Sasha, because I want to uh, add uh, David in the discussion because he's uh, the technical expert. If, he, if I can feel your handshake via internet, or if you hug me, then I would say yes. Uh, but uh, that, because that was a very uh, interesting point that, that uh, Sasha mentioned. So uh, what about a physical interaction? Because my, my daughter, she, for instance, she just started at the university, her first uh, semester, and she said, it's online, it's so boring. It's so boring and yeah. I need interaction. You know what I mean. <laughs> Yeah, sure. It, it, it is boring to be a pure online. I totally agree. And um, I always say, uh, let's don't get rid of the offline interaction. It's still a really important part of the whole learning process, uh, especially when it comes to teaching creativity um, and collaboration. Um, but again, I think uh, we can make this more self-directed and more dynamic. Because uh, like, if we take the example of your daughter, uh, probably if she enters now the first semester, that's the kind of group of people she will stick with for the next, I don't know, like five, four uh, years uh, in, in, in her entire studies. What would be even better is if she's like maybe even intelligently paired with other people like who share the same interests, who have the same pace, or maybe even completely different learning goals but could work together on a project. So I think these kind of more organizing hackathons yeah. mm -hmm. uh, would be a, a, a much better way uh, in the future. OK, thank you. Petri? Yes, thanks. Uh, I actually wanted to come back to this uh, sort of flexibility and individual responsibility question on, on, on learning, because I really think it's in the core, in the core of, of what we are talking about when we are addressing the future future of, of, of learning and, and, and teaching and also higher education. Um, definitely, we should try to develop a sort of conscious, self-directed uh, direct learning, uh, learning culture. But it's a, it's a long story and, and it's a very dif uh, difficult journey, actually. Even for, for the strong learners, if we just, you know, say that uh, this is our offering you, you can take whatever you want from these three thousand or ten thousand courses it's a it, it's a really impossible task uh, for, for most of us to 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 come up with a solution that is meaningful and and a kind of effective um so it in a way it really puts a pressure towards guidance and advising it's like, you know, in Finland, we have a lot of forests. And it's, uh, if you say you're an individual that, look, there's a forest, and, and you, you probably find that something interesting in there, and you just send her or him there yeah. without a map, it's, 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 it's probably going to be a disaster. And I, I think it's, mm. it's the same way in, in higher education, that if the current paradigm, in a way, is, is that we, we teach and then we provide support and guidance and advising uh, 
for supporting that. It might be even better to, to understand it a different way that we, we primarily guide, advise and, and provide alternative directions and then we also teach. Mm. Mm. Yeah, very interesting, very interesting. Mitri, can I just say, we yeah, have over 20,000 degrees right now in Germany on offer, yeah? 20,000 higher education degrees alone. How do you find your way in that, right? Mm. It's it's crazy. So I totally agree with that. And I think that's also why, um, of course, the whole system needs transformation, right? We need to start on earlier so that people actually learn and have support and i think it's not like just throwing them out and it's like okay now find your way but we see new models as well and new projects already where we have like learning guides early on that support projects that support the learners but the learners learn themselves like where can i go who can i ask where can i find information i need and things like that and i think i agree we need to start much earlier on that then also in higher education and later on when it comes to lifelong learning we have this transformation really on uh, this overwhelming word that you also described, right? With yeah. knowledge and choice, that's crazy. Um, I don't know when it was, five years ago, uh, um, the chancellor here in Germany, Angela Merkel, mm. she uh, she said uh, that the quote was, uh, internet is a new Neuland, area. Yeah. yeah, it's Neuland <laughs> to all of us. Yeah. And everybody was laughing about this sentence. Mm. And... Um, there was a shitstorm in the internet. Then I um, was in uh, Washington, D.C. four years ago. I talked to Jeff Jeffries, who is an icon on an internet uh, science and stuff like this. And the first he said, uh, I welcome you. And uh, really, uh, I, w I must say that it's so great what your chancellor has said. Mm. And I said, what? Everybody was laughing about. And he, he said, she's so exactly right because we don't know what is yeah. going on in and the internet. And what to do with it. It's yeah. just the... the beginning yeah. so we all don't know what is going to happen and uh, David um, to mention this scientists have proven our cognitive abilities continue to decline due to technical development because we all get used to uh, uh, put everything or the, 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 all the tasks and the devices and you know what I mean so what does this mean um, when we talk about a future and lifelong learning Oh. Your 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 mute First. button. Uh, so no 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 no. No no. Yes. Yeah, we hear we hear you. We hear you, David. Sound delay. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry about that. Um, so, so I think it actually increases uh, the need to first of all learn how to learn, and I yeah. actually see uh, yeah. a huge role for that um, for universities because universities and and institutions of higher education. I think are great at teaching you how to think first of all um, also of course uh, schools uh, before higher education but especially higher education um, in the future in the context of future skills has more and more a role for actually teaching you how to learn effectively how to use the digital media mm. like more these sorts of meta skills that are so important uh, to be then successful in your job because you can't rely on your <laughs> first degree or maybe even on your second degree mm. but you need to continuously learn and also adapt to these new ways of learning working um, and also teaching right sorry Runa I, I didn't want to interrupt you you want you want to no. add something no no no, no. okay <laughs> all good <laughs> yeah 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 uh, it's uh, it's also about patience so how long does this transformation should should take us Rona. The sooner the better. I mean, we're starting now, right? Today. I mean, what we're doing here in the hackathon, I think, is already an amazing step. And th th that's also, there you see, you know, people get together without anyone telling them what they have to do. Imagine that. They just get together, they find solutions, they brainstorm, they collaborate. And, uh, and I think things like this are really amazing. There are great projects out there already. There are also universities practicing this already. And um, I think we have to focus on this now. We have to focus on these people that want to push this change, that have ideas ideas that want to get on board and uh, like I said I mean also in my talk and I think we sometimes talk about these things like they're far away you know like future skills sometime in the future but it's our reality already today right and I think that I totally appreciate it can be challenging as well. Our universities aren't agile organizations you know they aren't built for this change and also for us um, it can be exhausting, right? It can be tiring. I don't know how many times you have done something like this here. You can't see our crazy technical setup here be behind <laughs> the scenes, but it's incredible. And also for me, it's the first time doing something like this in the setting and you feel uncomfortable sometimes, right? You're not sure is it gonna go right or wrong? Things might not go right. and. 
but that's exactly what it is. That's what it is to be alive. That's the setting we're in here today. We're practicing it today. So I think we have actually no more time for, for this discussion in a way. We have to get to work, you yeah, know. Yeah, so but what I wanted to address <laughs> with the quote of Angela Merkel mm. is uh, maybe we have to be more patient, right? <laughs> um, no, I mean, I agree with Angela Merkel in a way that we have no idea what it is in the sense of who can really use it right. Yeah? yeah, like who can also really harvest the knowledge that's in there. I mean, who just uses, I don't know, Google and Facebook and researches some things, but who really grasps all the information that's in there, how to use it to my advantage, how to find what I need. And um, that's, I think, really challenging and something we should look at. Um, but yeah, if we want to take people on board, and I think we saw in Corona everything that was possible, right? How we moved online, how it was possible also with the universities for a while to do this, and the unbelievable amounts, gazillion euros, I don't even know, billions, <laughs> trillions, I've lost count, that money that is all of a sudden available. So I think no one can say anymore, it, it is not possible. We can do it, you know, if we really want it, if we prioritize it right. Yeah, but it's difficult because um, if you address it to the politics, uh, who but said... But I think we heard that, you know, skills and education is the center of also to rebuild Oh, that sounds a bit harsh, but to, to rebuild the European Union, I, I think that's somehow a term you use, like, you know, to get back after this crisis. And we know that these skills are essential. So how can we really shift it more into the focus as well? And I think education is still a bit unsexy sometimes. You know, schools, like, you know, also what innovative solutions did we come up for schools with in the, in the last no, few I won't minutes? Agree. So um, I think there's, it, it's becoming, it's, it's more and more happening now, but I think we can really still shift the focus more on this and say, you know, we can do it. And we, we saw what we were capable of doing in the last few months. So I yeah. think uh, there is so much option there and so much that has happened already as well. So Antoinette, I want to bring you in uh, and maybe you can leave your role like as a politician and speak more in private uh, now. <laughs> um, so how difficult is it to uh, f maybe for, for, uh, for people who, yeah, expect so much from politics yeah <laughs> because the pressure is really high expectations are high and uh, the politics must uh, set it a little bit down and uh, uh, and and uh, press the brake you know what i mean so uh, maybe you can describe this this uh, tension field uh, yes, thank you. I, I wanted to, to take the floor in this because the discussion is extremely, extremely interesting. And uh, what is indeed important to be taken into account, and it's based on the experience uh, over the years and working on these matters, is that there are various uh, things happening. I mean, the digital transformation is there. It's been there before the crisis it is now accelerated. And there are various stakeholders and actors involved. And everybody is concerned in one or another way. So bringing the various perspectives is already a huge challenge. And this is what we've been trying to do. Uh, even in preparation, as I said, uh, the action plan, because what is the purpose for us? The purpose for us is to support, to facilitate actually the exchange of information of good practices. I think it's been said already on several occasions, there is a wealth of knowledge, experience, different practices. And sometimes education institutions, learners, trainers, they get lost. So mm -hmm. what is really important is to make sure that this is brought together, the various perspectives are brought together in order to see what works well, what doesn't work well. You certainly know uh, that the education is not the competence of, of the EU. This is why we are there to support the member states and the st uh, in their efforts. And uh, we are actually providing this uh, a platform, listening and bringing the various uh, viewpoints on, uh, on that. So, so Certainly, this is a challenge, it will remain a challenge, and this is what I said, I mean, it will require concerted efforts, it will require a lot of cooperation and collaboration. It's been already there, and we would like to see, and we are expecting that this will uh, continue. This one point that I wanted to make, I want to go back to one of the issues about the 
the different experience uh, of uh, online and offline learning. And as I said, we've been listening to stakeholders in order to know what kind of proposals we can make for the future with regard to digital education. And uh, you will not be surprised that around 42% of uh, those who responded to uh, our consultation actually see merit and benefit exactly in the blended, uh, in the blended learning. I mean, going completely to online learning it will be really not an option. But what we have to do, and I very much agree here with the Sasha, really the soft skills are very important, the creativity, the communication, the teamwork, and this can happen when really people meet offline and uh, work together. What is important to do is to use in an intelligent, smart way, the digital technologies that are existing and the opportunities that they're offering. I see. I see. Thank you. Yeah, Sasha, please edit. Um, I just want to uh, build on what um, Antoinette said. Uh, we are talking a lot for advanced technologies, for advanced communities, and uh, obviously this is the avant-garde, if you want, that will drive the education and uh, the knowledge for the future. But let's not forget that uh, within this uh, digitally enabled world, uh, we have uh, also a growing uh, digital divide. And um, uh, on a worldwide level, we have 31% uh, of the people that never entered the internet. They don't know that uh, this digital world exists. And some of them are also in Europe. Uh, I'm not sure I can quote the statistics. Uh, so, uh, well, uh, because we are speaking about skills, uh, I think that hand-to-hand -hand with the uh, digital skills, advanced skills uh, for the future, soft skills on how to navigate in this world, uh, we should also incorporate in the educational system uh, um, mechanisms for building up inclusiveness and give back culture mm -hmm. because uh, we are learning the world uh, while creating it and obviously there is a need for those that are already knowledgeable to participate into uh, equipping the whole community with the right skills so that they can cope with the future and that's very, very critical um, to be part of the agenda of the um, standard and informal education and to grow the next generation people with this mentality and with uh, this responsibility, if you want. Yeah. When we talk uh, about advanced technology, about uh, digital education and skills, and you take a look at Europe's map, so there is also, there are massive gaps, yeah, right? But the question is, do we need equality on this field? Uh, Petri, what would you say? Well, thank you. It's a, it, 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 at the surface level, it's a, it's a very much uh, kind of an easy question to say, yes, we, we, we yeah. need. We, we need investments. We need a lot of a lot of effort. Um, of course, then when we when we look at the, look at the details, it's uh, it, it's much more difficult to to see how, let's say, at the at the curriculum level, we we optimally uh, sort of uh, deliver uh, towards the objectives. Um, and I think this actually comes back to what we already addressed when we, when we talked about the flexibility and agility and sort of an individual responsibility. So so. So at the, at, at the overall level, we have to offer much more competencies for, for digital skills and, and, and at, at different levels. Uh, but a lot of different kinds of, uh, of, of uh, resolutions, uh, more basic, more advanced, uh, are, are really needed. And also uh, leveraging uh, sort of different, different sorts of, of learning opportunities from, from very micro micro level uh, pieces and elements to 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 larger entities so i, I yeah. think it's a very very demanding and even very heterogeneous offering that we're talking about. Yeah, you are right. Uh, and if we talk about lifelong learning, uh, I am wondering who we are talking about really. 
you know and this is also uh, about uh, ex uh, ex exclusiveness uh, and that's le that lead me le that leads me to a provocative question the field of uh, digitization is the only one we don't learn that much from the older generation uh, petri because i know in the northern uh, countries of europe uh, the older generation is more integrated um, in this uh, issue? Well, in a, in a way, if I may continue, I, I guess you're right in that, that we, we don't learn directly on, on digitalization from, <laughs> from the past generations, but, but at the end of the day, it's, it's still that digitalization is, is one means of achieving something that I, I think we are, are trying to achieve as a uh, as humans and uh, uh, as societies and in that sense we can also learn from uh, from the past generations uh, to to to, live, to re really elaborate what role digitalization plays in achieving uh, let's say our our grand challenges in sustainability or aging population or or many many others so in wider context uh, there are things to learn and kind of a, seeing that continuum, I, I think it's also valuable. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, because I, if, you, uh, if you take a look on the population of Europe, like 500 million uh, inhabitants in Europe, or maybe let be 600,000, I don't know, take the half of it, they're older than, I don't know, 50 maybe? Uh, maybe mm. yeah something like this uh, and uh, so th maybe this is uh, also a problem so um, and they must be developed uh, tools to integrate them right absolutely i think intergenerational anyway has to play such like such more of an important role because this quote learning from the old so yeah but I, I think that's also a challenge that we see in a way because maybe you don't feel so comfortable sometimes yeah. as a teacher or so because you you know they are they're so savvy and they know all <laughs> this and, and and i think that's really a shift also in the learner teacher relationship but generally i think there's so much to learn from each other always um and especially from people of different generations, especially from uh, people of different backgrounds. And I have a lot of older mentors and they say to me, Rona, you're serious? We've discussed this in the 90s already, you know, <laughs> yeah. and now you think you come up with something new. So I think it's really important that we have this exchange and that we, of course, also take concerns seriously of different generations and that we have much more of an exchange there. And I totally, I mean, agree with everything what was said also in terms of how much presence do we need? Where do we need presence? In my eyes, it's no way that everything happens in the digital world, but that's exactly that. We have to rethink what happens in presence and do we still really need a Vorlesung, yeah? Or can we do this via video and then we can meet in person to do other things? But that's exactly the rethinking that has to happen now and I think before Corona, around 16% or so of the universities in Germany had a digital um, strategy, and now it's around 50% or so. So we still haven't written. I'm like, you know, everyone needs a digital strategy. You know, everyone needs a, a chief technological officer at a university to think of how are we going to do this mm. because it's going to be so critical in the future. Yeah future yeah and uh, talking about uh, technical development david uh, there are always uh, or the i can <laughs> see also a fight of systems yeah if you look to uh, to the asian side of our uh, <laughs> globus and uh, so it might be also very um, difficult for europe uh, to take position i don't know how you see the the, the global competition the technical global competition yeah, of, of course, it's, it's, it's a big question uh, to talk about uh, competition among these tech giants. But um, if we just look at the educational sector, for example, in terms of learning platforms and also in terms of, for example, using artificial intelligence for learning and for assessing people's skills, there are, of course, again, in the US and especially also in China, um, platforms that do this quite well, uh, that deploy very, very advanced AI technologies, for example, to do skill assessments, to, do, to generate personalized learning paths. It's also scary, <laughs> right? Of course, this is scary. Um, and even more a case, by the way, to, uh, you know, to, to um, get some basic understanding across the entire society regarding digital skills, because it's important to know what's actually possible, but mm. even more important, it's also important to know what's not impossible, uh, what, what's, what's not possible yeah. uh, 
with these digital skills. But speaking about, for example, the approach that uh, these Chinese um, technology companies um, are going here, it's much more fixed. It's um, it's they, they 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 allow for for a self-paced. Um, uh, um, a journey basically through learning plans, but the goal is always fixed. You can't choose a lot here, for example, in K-12 education, if you look at these Chinese technology uh, learning companies. Um, and I think with our European approach, with having this more, you know, humanistic, um, collaborative, more open, more free approach, I think we are on a good way if we leverage that and mm. uh, be maybe uh, not so patient and more curators to just try it and test it uh, because mm -hmm. it's actually not that hard to start. I'm always talking about these advanced personalization technologies, but to be honest, mm -hmm. uh, we started two years ago with a simple Excel sheet, with a simple <laughs> Excel formula uh, to generate personalized Excel sheets for our participants <laughs> in our programs, and that was called personalization, yeah. and it worked perfectly. Yeah. David, thank you very much. Uh, unfortunately, the, uh, this was your final statement and uh, I um, want the other participants to formulate also a final sentence and which begins with I wish and uh, maybe you are the first Antoinetta, then Petri and then Sasha. Yes, I wish to continue very closely working together too with the various uh, stakeholders and actors uh, active in this field. Thank you. <laughs> okay, Petri. Yes, thank you. Um, I wish we really succeed in, in making the learning itself much more attractive and, and comfortable mm. for, 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 for many than it is currently. I mean, in, in panels like this, learning quite self-evidently has a positive <coughs> connotation, but that's that's not always the case. And even the even the notion of lifelong learning may may sound like a lifelong sentence to some of so some of the uh, sort of members of the society. So we have decided to talk about life-wide learning as an opportunity in in our university, that really seeking to pro provide new ways of of offering interesting learning possibilities for different kinds of groups, uh, not only degree students, but increasingly different different groups in society. That's that's something I wish we all continue. Thank you, Petri. Sasha? Um, I wish our collective uh, wisdom after this crisis will lead us to be more open uh, for new skills and uh, uh, many people uh, will uh, really uh, be curious and uh, we'll take advantage of uh, all good uh, programs to upgrade their skills that are available. That's the only way we to pave the path to the future. Yes, thank you, Sasha. So finally, Rona. Well, I wish that we continue to be brave and positive and that we join forces with all these amazing people and ideas that are already out there that we see here in the last two days and that we push this conversation forward into a bright future. <laughs> future <laughs> skills, lifelong learning. That was really a very interesting conversation. And um, I say thank you to Sasha, to Petri, to David, to Antoinetta, and to Rona. Wish you a wonderful day. And for sure, hackathons will be part of this, uh, what we are, were talking about the last 40 minutes. Thank you all very much and have thank a good you. day. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank Goodbye. You. Goodbye. Yes, thank you, Rona, that you, you joined us much. here in okay. presence.